Yo, what's good people? It's Jay Cactus and we're back again with episode 21 of Cactus Combos now. In today's episode, I've literally got the goat with me. He's a sick producer, the OG of FL Studio Tutorials, an entrepreneur, and he really doesn't need an introduction. It's Busy Works Beats. Busy, what's good, my bro? What's going on, Jay? How you feeling? How you guys feeling? I'm, I'm doing good. Yeah. I can't complain. Good to hear, man. Yeah, sorry sorry to bring you on the show. I know you said earlier that you were a bit tired. You've just been away <laughs> in Vegas, so you're trying to catch up on everything. So I appreciate you taking the time out of your day to, to speak to us. Indeed, indeed. I just came from seeing my beautiful woman, Nicole Nix. If you guys know her, I'm not sure, but uh, producer underscore Nicole Nix. And I was out there for like two weeks at her place. So I'm, my body's getting used to coming back to the East Coast. So like I said to you, you know, off camera or whatever. Yeah. Uh, forgive my attire, like my my appearance isn't matching my my energy right now. But, uh, I'm in good, good spirits, and uh, I'm just here to break it down with you, share the, all the secrets today. Good to hear, man. So, so how was Vegas then? Were you was that just were you just taking some time off, just spending some time with your girl? Were you getting was there any business there, or was it just oh. some relaxing time? Yeah, the beautiful part is she's a music producer, so everything is always like business and life coexist. Um, yeah. I remember we would even take some time to just lock in and get stuff done, um, which, yeah. you know, to keep the story short, um, you know, really, I learned how to have more peace and calm and to be more organized, because the biggest thing that we do is we work in the business. We're so right. used to waking up, doing YouTube videos, editing, doing the graphics and all this over and over and over again. We forget that we have a whole nother side to the business. And so when I was out yeah. there, I didn't have all my equipment. Like you said, like I'm not in my studio right now. I'm at the I'm in a corner of my house. And, um, right. you know, imagine you didn't have your keyboard behind you, your mic. What kind of mic is that? This is the Lewitt 440 Pure, I think it's called. Okay. Well, I've been wanting to switch over to the SM7B. I know that's like the best podcast mic, right? Is that what you've been using? Yeah, I just used Michael Jackson's mic. I figured if Michael Jackson used it, <laughs> that's going to be right. <laughs> so imagine you don't have any of your studio set up, like your your norm kind of gets thrown off. So I had my new yeah. norm became working on the back end of the business. And so I got a right. lot done in a very short amount of time. And, um, nice. you know, she calmed me down and brought me peace. So I, it's like hitting the reset button for real. And now we'll see what comes out of that, energetically speaking. So that was yeah. what the Vegas trip was all about, helping her move in and just hit and reset for a second. Nice. I bet it's good to have that relationship where you've both got that common interest of music production because for a lot of people, maybe a lot of producers that I wanted to take themselves seriously, maybe their girlfriends don't really fully understand because they have, they don't really know anything about music production, but I bet when you're with someone that has that common interest, it just makes life a lot easier, right? Yeah. Yeah, I remember my mom. Literally, I'd be sitting on this laptop just like we are right now and just in a kitchen yeah. somewhere when I used to live with my parents. And they would just think I was wasting time. I'm like, I'm working. Yeah. I know I look like I'm sitting here doing nothing, but I'm working. And this <laughs> is when I was building up, you know, the beginning of Busy Works Beats to the point yeah. where now we've trained over 700,000 producers around the world. We've done over seven figures. We work with the top audio company brands in the world, like Universal Audio, Isotope, Arteria, Image Line, who made FL, uh, who else? Uh, Sweetwater, and on and on and on. And we train people, yeah. and some have gone to work with Drake, Post Malone, Young Thug, R French Montana, Ray Schremer, Ariana Grande, NBA Youngboy, and like all these dope people. And in the beginning, it just looked like I was just sitting on a computer, twisting my fingers. So I can yeah. understand how, like to yourself, maybe you have a story like that, or to other people who are listening in, you know, we're not taken seriously because of what yeah. it looks like. And so, like you said, you got to find that person who understands the be not only music production, like not only that we're not wasting time making beats, but also we're entrepreneurs. So the first three years are going to be like, I'll tell you, I mean, how old are you? You look really young. Well, thank you, but I'm 28, so I'm not that young. Oh, it, must be a good, <laughs> it must just be a good skincare routine. <laughs> that's insane, right? I would have said yeah. you're like 21 or 18 even. That's crazy. You do not I, I must be doing something right. The diet must be on point. <laughs> <laughs> that's insane. I need your routine. Because uh, I learned that the like the skin right here is, is very sensitive and it shows age. So I need to work on my uh, under eye skin. <laughs> but um, dang, yeah, I'm 30 now. And uh, what was I going to say? I forgot my train of thought for a second. Rewind me for two uh, seconds. I think we, we were talking about, you know, like people maybe, people might not think you're serious 
you, you mentioned in that when you were working at home, your mom didn't really think you were working. You were just, you know, she thought you were just playing on the computer. If that's the avenue we were going down. And now, yeah, I was saying, I bet people, a lot of people can relate to that because a lot of people want to take themselves seriously, but the people around them can't see the same vision, can they? They don't, they don't see what's going on in that person's mind, so they might not think that they're actually being serious about the craft, or they think that music is something that's not something you can make a living off. I feel like that's a common thing that people deal with as producers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're exactly right. And I love your channel because it's so... Yeah, we'll get into your channel and how I see it. And uh, yeah, I was going to mention how in the beginning when I was 22, 23, I had to literally just step away from going out with friends. I had to stop partying. I had to stop going out because that was distracting me from pouring my energy into my idea. I just remember cutting my friends yeah. off completely. Like I I was at this party because we were used to partying in the college life. So he invited me to a party after we graduated. And he, his motive was chasing girls and blah, blah, blah. And I'm sitting there on my phone looking at PayPal and it's saying 26,000, something, 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 whatever for the month. And I'm just yeah. like, why am I here? Like, I'm literally just wasting time. And this is not fun anyway. Like, making money is fun. Right. Creating content is fun. Helping people is fun. Like, this chase, like all that party stuff was not fun to me anymore. And um, I yeah. had to take a, a break for two to three years and really focus in and lock in. And I wasn't, you know, you have to, I had to sacrifice is what I'm trying to say. So that's why I asked you what age yeah. you were because you know, that's critical in uh, what we're developing. How long did it take you to, excuse me, how long did it take you to pull up your channel? I'd say I started the tutorial channel maybe just over a year ago. So it has been quick. It has been quick. Yeah, it's pretty, pretty fast. So yeah, I think, I can't remember when I uploaded my first video. I want to say maybe around 14 months. I'll need to go back and check. Mm -hmm. That's insane. And I love that you're not only because people don't understand they're like, why doesn't your channel have a million subscribers? And why doesn't you why don't you get a million views since you have a million yeah. subscribers? Let me explain to your audience and to my audience as well when I uh, send them to your podcast episode is one, we're in a niche that is extremely like I want you guys to understand when I go to like Clubhouse or any networking event, producers are like the smallest group of everything. Like right. not only is music small, producers are like the small, small part of a small pond. And there's not that many producers, you know, especially engineers. Engineers is even more tiny. Yeah. So, you know, our potential numbers are not astronomical. Like if we had a channel like um, I'm trying to think of another channel that's big. What's a big channel like a uh, PewDiePie or Jake Paul, one of them? Uh, yeah, well, I had like Logan Paul, um, PewDiePie, like you said, trying to think off the top of my head now. I mean, there's, there's so many, isn't there? Yeah. Um, yeah, I'd say maybe. Well, yeah, what's Logan Paul on right now? He must be in the millions, right? I don't know. I just bought his. That's the first time I've ever bought a fight. I've literally bought my first fight I bought was Logan Paul in uh, Mayweather. Really? It's insane. It just shows how influence works. Was it worth the money? I only caught a little bit, but I would yeah. say yes because of what it symbolized to me. Yeah. I would say yeah. And, uh, you know, that's a side story. I don't want to get too deep into that. But my point is our market is not millions and millions and millions of people. So when your channel yeah. is 50K, you know, we have to compare it to a pootie pie who serves the masses. Multiply 50K by like 10. That's what real that's the influence and impact you actually have. Yeah. And so people don't understand that. So when they see 50K, they're like, oh, that's just 50K. You know, other channels have a million. It's like, no, an equivalency yeah. in comparison, that's 500,000. Uh, right. So my point is. You grew really quick, really fast, and it was in a, a niche of a niche. So, you, yeah. you know, drill seems to be the thing. And then That's drill right. is under music production. Well, drill is under FL, which is another niche. And then you got yeah. music production, which is the niche of the whole music industry. So it's a niche of a niche of a niche, and you still yeah. figured out a way to make it pop. So that's that's what it takes is that smart entrepreneurial mindset. Now, where did you how did you get it, though? How did you learn that? Um, I mean, before before I started the channel, I think the thing that helped me was I, I did kind of follow that traditional path where I went to university and then I got a job. In the job, I had some sales experience, some business experience, and I was in that job for like five years. And my position was dealing with the biggest brands that the company looked after. So I was dealing with, you know, like huge names like G4S and Harley Davidson. So I was familiar with like, I had like a business mindset. and. I feel like I had to have that job to make me realize that it wasn't what I wanted, if that makes sense. So because I was there for five years, it took me that time to realize like, shit, this isn't, this isn't what life is 
about for me personally. Like some people can do a nine to five and they enjoy it, they're happy with it, and that's cool. But for me, I just yeah, after working there, I just knew her. I was like, shit, music's always been my thing. I didn't want to get to like forty, fifty years old and look back and not even want to try music. So that's when I took the plunge and left my job to set up the channel and do everything. But I think, I think I got the, I think I got the mindset from listening to people like you, listening to like the Producer Grind podcast, and just constantly just absorbing all this information. And then when it was time to set up the channel, I kind of knew what I needed to do. I was like, right, I need to, I need to narrow down on something that I wanted to find something that people were kind of searching for, but there wasn't a lot of competition. And at the time, I could see. How fast drill was picking up. It was around about the time when Pop Smoke. I think it was around about the time that Pop Smoke died. So I feel like when when Pop Smoke's songs were blowing up, that's when the world started tuning into drill. Because before it was like, yeah, you had Chicago drill and UK drill. But when Pop Smoke had his hit songs, I feel like that's when the world tuned in. So anyway, I was looking around and I thought, yeah, there's some, there's a few people doing drill tutorials, but. There's no one really just focusing on drill tutorials, and if they are, they're not that consistent with it. So I was like, right, I'm gonna get into this lane whilst it's active, be real consistent with it, upload twice a week, the same time every week, and just get my face out everywhere. Start the podcast, build up relationships, expand my network. You know, I don't know. I'm like waffling on right now, <laughs> but that's basically it. Yeah, I think I got all the information from partly from my experience at my old work, and then. The rest of it from people like yourself and producer grind just absorbing the information. So I think that answers it. Thank you. Yeah, it reminds me of a, a cut. Like the way our skin works is like we can get these little micro abrasions or these micro dots in our skin. It may be yeah. an, an an intrusion, a cut, but it's because you focused on one specific thing for long enough, and then the cut became right. visible, and now people see the cut. So now yeah. it's like, here's a cut. Now, once you get established as a cut or you make that impact and kind of entrench into a market, people will always remember. Like right now you have your, what's it called? Your authority. Like you're, you have right. a position, it's called. So you've reached the point where now you can switch it up. You don't have to do drill and do this one thing all the time. You can expand yeah. and do other stuff because you have a name and you have a face. But most people, they don't get to the point where they create that cut. They don't ever break into a market because they don't ever focus enough in one area. They kind of spread yeah. out in all these little micro cuts everywhere and nobody can see it. Like I can't see, I probably have cuts all over my hand, but I can't see any, you know, they're not big enough. Yeah. Makes sense. And yeah. then once you have that big cut, you always remember you had a cut there. So that's right. what you've accomplished. And you did it really well because in the beginning, most people, again, the mistake they make is they try to come in like, oh, I'm going to go head to head with everybody and I'm going to make enemies with everybody. I'm going to you know, <laughs> undercut everybody, do all this stuff. And that's the yeah. worst way to come into this. Of course, this yeah. Area because I told you off camera, I said we have a mastermind group of all the people who understand this type of philosophy. It comes from Napoleon Hill's um, Think and Grow Rich. Have you ever read that book? Think and Grow Rich. Yeah, I have a long time ago. Yeah, and uh, there's a principle in there called the mastermind principle, which says, you know, right. take all the top dogs, put them together, and they can become even bigger. Like That's right, yeah. You know, we can we can all do 100 percent like uh, I learned this from another mentor, Dan Pena. He said, would you rather want 100 percent of 100,000 or would you want 20 percent of 20 million? Mm -hmm. And the answer is obvious. You know, 20 percent of 20 million. It sounds like you're getting less because you only have 20 percent. But 20 yeah. percent of 20 million is four million as opposed to all having 100 percent right. of 100,000, which is where, you know, when you get into a deeper business, you kind of hit a ceiling by yourself. And you need to yeah. kind of expand the network to increase the revenues and work less and make more. It makes a lot of sense. So my point is, you've made a really good strategic move, which is be friendly with everybody first. And then yeah. you'll start to see how easy it is to like move. It's, it's so much easier when you can come. Like, for example, you're about to do a 50K giveaway. Yeah, that's right. What, do you, did you, uh, what are you going to give away? Did you choose yet? Yeah, so I know you asked what mic this was earlier. Um, I'm giving away one of these microphones. I've got a MIDI keyboard to give away. And then the rest of it is VSTs from companies. So like my best friend Jacob is giving me a few copies of Octave. Ocean's giving away a copy of Elements. We've got Image Liner giving away a copy of FL Studio. Um, the Baby Audio Bundle, the Cable Guys Shaper Box Bundle. And there's a few more in there. So mostly VSTs. And then all of my, my drum kits and sample packs as well. That's sick. I didn't even realize it was that big of a giveaway. So you're going to have one winner or like multiple winners? Uh, there's going to be three. So I think when I added it up, there's maybe around about 
$3,000 worth of prizes. So it's just going to be free to enter. And then maybe after two weeks, we'll just generate three names. First name gets the first place prizes, the second place gets the second and so on. So yeah, it should be good. It's the biggest giveaway I've done. So it's good. it should be crazy. That's super dope. And like I said, just being connected to the mastermind, not only will you get more prizes, like people trying to contribute because they want their name in front of people. Let's be honest. It's all yeah. self-interest. But you also right. can have them send people to your thing because people are like, wow, this is a giveaway. It's a cool thing to tell my audience. So you're going to get yeah. 10 times the amount of people. Do you have an email list? I do. Yeah. 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 So instead of like, let's say a thousand opt-ins, now you're getting 10,000 opt-ins in a week. And we've done this before. And it, we had almost 20,000 opt-ins just by doing this. So like, yeah. that's what I'm saying. Like when you get connected, stuff happens a lot easier and um, you work less. That's the craziest part. You're going to be like, wow, I didn't even really lift a finger and I'm yeah, making these huge returns. So that's how people should think. Your audience should think like that. You, sh- you know, should start to use leverage a little bit more because you're established. Right. You're, you have a position now. And um, what do you think? I, I want to ask you a question because I know this question was going around the community. Do you think it's talent or do you think it's uh do you think talent's not really needed for, to be a, a music producer? I think hard work beats talent because let's say like, I'm, I'm not the best producer in the world. I know there's so many other producers that are so much better than me, but because I'm consistent with my videos, I'm, I'm giving a lot to people, I'm leading with value, I'm getting my face out everywhere I can get it out. I feel like that's why my channel's grown and that's why you know I'm starting to see some success. Whereas you could have another producer who's amazing at making beats, he'll just kill any beat, but if his beats are just sat on his hard drive and he's not getting his face out there and he's hiding behind a logo and not posting on social media, then who's going to win, you know? So I think in the grand scheme of things, I think hard work beats talent, definitely. I don't know if you agree. No, I'm listening to you and I agree. I'll tell you. I'll give you, I'll give your audience and yourself the secret. So like I said, there's a mastermind of like the hundred top folks in this, uh, what we do. Right. And, you know, Illmind's in there, Jacob's in there, Jack's in there, you know, Ocean and all people like them. Yeah. And um, the thing is, though, that only like six or ten of the hundred people actually take action. So right. imagine all the millions of followers we have. OK, yeah. out of the millions of people, there's only a hundred people that are actually moving and shaking. And out of the hundred, there's only ten Right. That to me blows my mind. So that's 10 people out of millions of people who may, you know, who have that hard work gene. And that's why they're at the top, you know, at the top of their game, because they're putting in the work and they're actually doing stuff, taking action and out of millions and millions of people. So I agree. Hard work is superior to talent because in this world, the only way you get a reaction is if you take action. Talent can just sit dormant. If it's not being put into action, there's no result. There's no reaction. So, 100%. yeah, I'm with you on that one. Yeah. Nope, man. Is your I family agree. in the military at all? No, not at all. No. <laughs> Why do you ask? No, most people who are affiliated with the military have like a structure in their life. They understand like the, the workings of hierarchy. Uh, I okay. just was curious. No, no, no family in the military. Um, I mean, I just come from a working class family. But yeah, I, I think I think I've been the first one in the family to actually take action and, and do something my, myself and set up my own business. Like as far as I can remember, like my parents and my grandparents have always worked for someone. My brothers both work for companies. So yeah, I've been the first one in the family to to do something like this. I think anyway. Mm-hmm. Now, How about you, yourself? Uh, no military family, uh, but or wait, no, I'm wrong. My grandfather was in the military, but. He didn't really oh, okay. influence me that uh, much. He was in World War, right. I think, two in France. But um, right. I was going to ask you, where are you taking your company? Like, what's the end? Where are you going with it? So right now, the, the main focus for me right now has, has been the YouTube channel and my, building up my website with sample packs and drum kits. So I'm really looking to build up the website, build up the product list on there. I think eventually I want to move on to plugins once I think my audience is big enough and once, you know, that's going to be the step at some point. So, yeah, I mean, it's going to be interesting to see how it pans out. I think that's the main focus, yeah, building up the website, maybe launching a uh, plugin at one point. But I am also focusing on the placement side of things as well. I'm trying to go after everything, which I don't know if that is a good idea or not. <laughs> but, I can, yeah, I'm just so hungry for everything that... I'm trying to do everything at the moment. 
And I feel like sometimes that can be good, but sometimes it can be bad because there's only so many hours in the day. So, you know, if I spend a couple hours trying to chase placements throughout the day, that's a couple hours that I could have been focusing on a kit for my website. So maybe that's one thing that I struggle with is like, right, where do I put all my focus, you know? Oh, yeah. So that makes I sense. Indeed. And you mentioned Jacob and um, Ocean before, and those are the people I hooked up to get their plugin developed. So I know I don't take credit for everything, but I do a lot of connecting behind the scenes. Like, for example, I just connected uh, Mars from 1500 or nothing to this random opportunity up in Denver um, to do this field day event, had all the top celebrities there. I think they raised like 20 something million for this event. And wow. and I just linked him up with that and linked him up with a couple other good folks. Who else did I Oh, I linked up this uh, rapper that I met on Clubhouse with an opportunity with a sync company. So nice. and they're going to do like a movie about it or something crazy like that. So I don't that's take crazy. I don't like broadcast that. What's that? I said that's crazy. Yeah, I don't broadcast this type of stuff, but I'm a, I, I'm just a connector or a catalyst behind the scenes. So I noticed the common denominator between uh, Ocean and, and Jacob is the plugins they have. And yeah. maybe people don't know, but I connected them to, you know, my friend Josh who helped me with my plugin. And then we had another uh, vendor as well, developer, to help us with a different plugin. But anyway, yeah, I want to nice. definitely bring you in the plugin game. So the understanding that people have to have is that we have to have, you know, understand there's three types of businesses. The first yeah. type of business is a cash flow business. And this is where we have our, you know, monthly income. Let's say your business goes up to about 30K per month. That's that type of business. It's just recurring yeah. monthly income, but it's heavily based on how much um, energy and effort you put into something like YouTube or like a sound pack, that will be your right. cash flow. It'll be something that just is very stable and foundational. Now, the second yeah. type of business is going to be high risk, high return type of business. And that will be your plugin because the difference between a plugin and a sound pack is that plugins could take up to nine months to develop. So right, yeah. you're going to have nine months where you're just waiting. It's like a placement. Placements are in this yeah. category, too. You put all this time and effort into something, but you have to wait for results to come. So yeah. it's not a monthly. You can't really predict it per month. And that's yeah. high risk, high reward. So you have to have that part of your business, too, so that you can gain more income to surpass that 30K kind of threshold per month. Right. Then you get to a business which is um, about protecting money. So this is like real estate, stocks, um, more like investing, safe money, like anything from 6% to about 12% a year return. So like right now, yeah. your business... Whenever, whatever you release could have 10,000% return, yeah. you know, crazy returns. And, you know, that's where your, your initial 100K, 250K is going to come from is that sound pack, those branded things. And then you're going to get into the software stuff. You could do half a million. I've, Kyle Beats said he did a million in like three months or, you know, yeah, in about three months. Oh, I heard that. Yeah, he did the podcast with Ross today. I heard him mention it on that. Just yeah, crazy I, figures. <laughs> And I believe it, you know, when you pump advertisements and you have something that works and you you hit the yeah. trend like you did with drill, it just you that's how crazy it is. And this is what I want for us is that we take the power back from all these companies we're making rich. I mean, think about it, Jay, like you're making image line rich, probably made them a million bucks by now. You're making any plug in company you made rich in the tens of thousands, probably hundreds of thousands of sales. And that money doesn't come back to you. Not that they don't want it to. It's just you can't. Yeah. It's hard to track course and now the question is what if you owned everything in their in your videos like you own the plugin you own the sound so now when you're making your tutorials mm -hmm. it all comes back to your ecosystem and that's yeah. what creates that bigger ball of like wealth is that now whatever you do can it will come back to you and it's not a selfish thing it's so that you can make better products and do cooler stuff with your audience so my point in saying all this is um you can do all those things you just mentioned you know the cash flow stuff sound stuff plugin stuff yeah. is your second tier business and that kind of retention, wealth uh, building or wealth retaining, I'll say, is a membership website. So right. whenever you get to that point, do you plan on doing like courses and the whole membership thing? Yeah, I definitely want to do a course. I was just speaking to Ocean and Jack about that yesterday because I know Jack just dropped a course recently. But yeah, that's I definitely want to do one, especially because I haven't really seen anyone do a, a drill course. So I feel like I can fill that pocket, definitely. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. And if you want a little boost... I was supposed to do a drill course with um, uh, DJ L, who cr literally created drill. Like he was the oh, really? innovator of drill. Like from Chicago, he's well respected in that matter. But things didn't pan out and whatever. 
But um, for example, like to your audience, this is how it would work. Let's say we created a partnership where you wanted to launch your drill course. You could leverage yeah. my hundreds of thousands of producers. I have t- almost 10,000 on our new platform. We're paying customers and already in this realm. So wow. you would just make a course, for example, I'm just saying for example, leverage yeah. the audience. We would do a 70-30 split. So 70% of the uh, income would go to you, 30% to me just because of all the marketing and crap I had to do to get the people there. And the content around it, et cetera, et cetera. And then you would build up not only money from the new audience, you would build a new audience at the same exact time. And let's say in in our term, I'm just showing how business goes down for your audience. And let's say in the terms, you could say, let's do this for a year. Or you could pull out at any time. And then you have all the rights. You maintain all your content and copyrights. It's like, what is there to really lose? I'm just, it's the equivalency of affiliate marketing. We're just doing it in a different way. And so that way you can, you know, get straight to it. That's why I respect you being friends with people off the bat, as opposed to like, just, you know, there's people out there who want to attack everybody. And this is, it's just a bad look from the beginning. Yeah, so, no, hundred percent. I think you're right though, because let's say for example, we did do that. I could drop a course that would be aimed at my 50,000 subscribers on my own. Like if I dropped the course myself on my own website, where, like that would be my target audience and my mailing list. But if it was through your system and through to your audience, which is much larger, even though you'd be taking a percentage, that's a whole audience, a whole portion of audience that might not have ever heard of me before. So yeah, I think that completely makes sense. Definitely. Yeah. And it's an endorsed traffic too. This is what the companies need to understand about you. Whenever you do do brand deals, we're not just sending random people to their website. You know, you're sending people who trust you to their website. Yeah. So whenever you get these companies talking about how they, you know, make some content and they want to use it in an ad, endorsed traffic is the highest level of traffic. It's it's trusted, pre-curated traffic. That's the highest tier, you know. um, And we so we just need to understand the value of that. I know this is I don't want to go too far into business because I don't know where your audience is as far as we we can we can go into it, man. I I want to encourage people to to get into that business mindset because I think it's it's about more than producing. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you as well, because a lot of the, the interviews that I've done have been about, you know, building up YouTube channels, getting placements. But I feel like you've been someone to look up to in terms of um, how you should run a business. You know what I mean? And how you can take being a, or how you can go from being a producer to an entrepreneur. So let's go into it, man. We're here for it. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I don't want to bore people to tears. Like, I came here for tips on FL. Not <laughs> <laughs> We're all good. Yeah, because everybody's not a business person like yourself. And, um, <laughs> and so just... That would be endorsed traffic, you know, curated traffic, already customers, you know, it's doing all the hard work for that yeah. specific brand, you know, and they're try- basically these companies are trying to get around paying Facebook tens of thousands of dollars. We're like, no, you owe us tens of thousands of dollars. This is not some cheap undercutting work. So that's what I appreciate about, uh, you know, what we're building here is just create our yeah. own syndication. It's, it's really that simple. And. Yeah, I mean, I, I, again, I just wanted to show people how deal structure happens, how it works, and all these different things. But there's infinite ways we could work together. I just am excited because you're, you ha- like, I'm telling you, there's so little people who really understand it, Jay. Like, I wish I could give you my insight because I study yeah. channels. I mean, I have a whole spreadsheet of just channels who are even focused on, like, FL, Ableton-type stuff. And even out of those people, there's probably 60 or 70. That's still not a lot of people. There's millions of us. Course. Like 60 or 70, yeah. but even out of the 60 or 70, there's only like six people who get it. You know what yeah. I mean? There's really no competition. It's just like, why aren't we working together to do cooler stuff? And um, I yeah, can definitely help right. you accelerate whatever you're um, trying to get into. And that's that's exciting for me. Appreciate that. Mm-hmm. Where do you think that comes from? Your, your kind of like passion for helping people? Um, I'll ask you this. Did you, you know, when you're making videos and you're, you're just making content, you're trying to get our own selfish intent, but then you start realizing like you're changing people's lives. Yeah. Like, and yeah. then when you got to that point, how did, what changed? Like when you started hearing those uh, people right in? I guess it becomes less about yourself and your own ego and more about other people. Because once you get those messages on Instagram from people saying, you know, oh, your tutorials really helped me. I'm, I'm like my production game has just gone up to like 10 levels. I managed to get a placement, blah, blah, blah. You're just like, shit, like I've, I've helped this kid. Like I don't even know this person. He lives halfway across the world, but 
Somehow I've been in my bedroom cooking up beats, showing him what to do, and he's managed to get a placement from it. And it's just a good feeling. It's just like, man, I've really helped this person. And it just it encourages you to do more. You just want to post more content because you just never know who it's going to affect and whose life you can change. So it's just rewarding. It becomes a lot more rewarding. Right. And, and it sounds like you've reached that level of what I call fulfillment. And once you feel that, like for real, you're like, this is better than going on a roller coaster. This is better than like all the external yeah. stuff. This is something internal that like I only unlock by going outside of myself. Right. And it's and it's addicting, like contributing and feeling like you're uh, changing somebody's life. That's really addicting. It's probably the most addicting thing because it's not only growth yeah. that we're addicted to. Because that's why I'm addicted to your situation. You have so much capacity to grow right now, which is exciting because I love seeing like, you know, point A go to point B, you know, rags to riches. We love those stories. Grand Theft Auto San Andreas, rags to riches story. 50 yeah. Cent, give rich or die trying. Rags to riches. We love the whole like before and after. And, course, um, yeah. and then it, you feel like you're contributing to somebody else, which is, again, another element that makes us super addicted to this. And um, that, again, you know, right. I know this is going back and forth between me and you, but people can take out of this conversation what it really takes. Speaking of, you hear that little ding? Yeah, that was the <laughs> that was the mastermind <laughs> chiming in. So oh, um, is that the one? <laughs> I have a special tone for it. <clears throat> Excuse me, but this is what it takes, you know, beyond just editing videos and doing the zoom ins and the zoom outs and the you know Definitely. all this transitional <laughs> things in the video. It's deeper than that. It's way deeper than that. Um, but I can respect yeah. it. Now, do you focus on editing? Like, do you do the whole shock factor thing? Um, I mean, my edits, I wouldn't say my edits have like the whole shock factor thing. The edits have got a lot better compared to when I first started doing videos because it was something fairly new that I had to get into as well. Whereas like now, yeah, I'm doing a lot more like maybe switching up the angle, doing different transitions, maybe cutting out the plug-in and having that in different areas so it's more visible so my editing's getting better like definitely getting better but i wouldn't say it's that like a it's not like a simon sabida type of video where you know where everything's like quick fast paced and it's really exciting mine's a little bit different to that mm -hmm. have you had simon on here yet yeah yeah we just recorded one i think he was the he might be the most recent one that i uploaded yeah okay. i like simon he's a cool guy yeah, he's he's very he's very humble, like yourself, very just humble. Like you're not trying to be Mr. Big Dog, like you know what I mean? I mean, maybe you are yeah. internally. You want to be number one. That, I get that. I mean, but you're not trying to stomp on people. Yeah. Um, who would you like <laughs> on your <laughs> Who would you like on your podcast next? Are you going to keep it in the producer community or you want to expand to like celebrity and stuff? Yeah, um, to be honest, it, it was always going to be mainly for producers because most of my audience is producers. Um but yeah, I mean, who who knows where it could grow? Like, I'd I'd love to have these conversations with with anyone. It could be like business people, it could be celebrities. But I always think about my audience at the same time as well. I'm always like, you know, my audience is producers, so they want to hear tips from other producers. So yeah, I think my main focus has been to get producers on here. But yeah, I'm I'm not really sure. I'm not really sure like which direction to take it because it's still fairly new. This this is the twenty first episode, so. You know, I'm, yeah, I'm not sure, to be honest. Oh, yeah, we got to do a sure. poll. We got to see, like, hey, guys, who do you want to see next? Like, because, again, it's just we love. And I'm telling you, here's the secret about, like, I know I seem like I'm just being, like, overly giving maybe or, like, too good to be true. But for me, it makes me feel, like, powerful when I can connect people. Like, that's something when you get to your level, yeah. like, it becomes connecting people. Like, that is valuable. Like, um, for example, you can make money just by connecting someone to get a plug in deal. You could say, OK, I just right. need 10% of the transaction and I'll connect you with my guy. Boom. Yeah. You just made business just by connecting two people. And when you get to your level that you're, I'm assuming you're trying to get to, that's Definitely. the game. Like I connected. I'll give you an example. And I'm saying this so we can move into the music production because I realize you, you, we are talking to music producers, not businessmen <laughs> here. So uh, what was I saying? So I connected this lady who has a three hundred million dollar um, or was it 100 or 300 million? I think it's 300 million. I'm getting sloppy now with the numbers. It's either 100 or 300 million, one of the two. Uh, project, yeah. uh, film studio project. It's called Malahat Studios off of Vancouver Island. And uh, I introduced her to this film producer who produces for like Bella Thorne, James Franco, and a whole bunch of other people. And he's like a mega entrepreneur. Wow. And I just connected those two. And whatever comes out of that, they attribute that to me. And then they open doors that I couldn't even walk into myself because they're so high level that, you know, I, I don't That's know crazy. everybody. 
Yeah. So that's that's what the game becomes at a certain point. It's just you're like, oh, I know somebody. I'll connect you. I'm telling you, when you when you get past the, you know, show and prove stage, which is I can teach people how to make the best drill beats in the world. You know, once you get yeah. once people understand, like, <laughs> yes, he is the go to for this. Like, then we yeah. get into the realms of of connecting, which is a whole different strategy. But yeah, let's talk about music production. I don't want to bore your audience with the businessy stuff. You might even have to put this section first. They're <laughs> going to kill me for just No, don't, don't worry. I think, I, think, I, think the, I think they'll all be excited to hear the business stuff, definitely. I think, it, I think it's valuable for people. I think you're right what you said then uh, again about, you know, just expanding that network because you might introduce one person to someone else and because, you know, you've made that good connection. This person is going to remember you and be like, oh, BusyWorks introduced me to so-and-so and we made this happen. And they're always going to remember you. And there might be a time where they introduce someone to you. And, the, you know, and it's just like, it's like you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours kind of thing. It's like, you're okay, you introduce this person. Then it could be like two years down the line. Then they introduce someone else to you and you build something up together. Like it just, it's just never ending, is it? It's just like a constant buildup of network, which is crazy. Mm-hmm. But I think whilst we're on the business topic, what, one thing that I did want to ask you is how do you decide which companies you're going to work with? Because I imagine with your channel, you'll get so many companies reaching out to do sponsored videos and can you use my plugin? You know, how do you decide which ones you're going to say yes to? Is it the company ethos and values? Is it the amount they're paying? Is it whether they're offering affiliate commission? You know, like how do you decide? That's a really good question, actually. Um, so there's a lot of different angles and I'll take the first one. One, I had to learn to say no to everybody. Like, I mean, when I say everybody, I mean, 99.9% of the emails coming in about, Hey, do this for my company. I said, no, Yeah. that's the first habit that is counterintuitive. We think if we, we were supposed to say yes to everything, but right. here's a principle I learned from Evan Pagan. He says, when you're trying to get the attention of a players, the moment you start messing with the C players, the A players become the C players. In other words, if you're trying to get, you know, a beautiful woman, like my beautiful woman, Nicole Nix, okay, <laughs> if she saw me uh, trying to get the attention of girls she thinks are really low class and low kind of vibrational state, she'd be like, he's not high value because he's chasing these low level things. Right. And she considers herself a high value woman, which she is, you know, a high potential, high capacity. Yeah. So she does not want to be grouped in the same group. So simply, if I were to chase, you know, low level women, she wouldn't want to be associated to me because that would bring her down. So the same thing goes with these companies. You know, if they're top tier companies, Universal Audio, Image Line, Arturia, excuse me, Arturia, um, who else? Uh, I'm missing some. Sweetwater. Slate Digital, maybe, Razer. Razer. How did I forget Razer? Yeah, the billion dollar (laughs) gaming laptop company called Razer, which I worked for, (laughs) worked with, not for, uh, for more years than Metro and Murda, which is, people don't understand that. And, um, my point is in saying that not to flex, but just to show a little context Yeah, is you have like, they do not want, if I started working with like a mom and pop plug-in shop, you know, they may be cool with it, but if, if it's a company they're not really rocking with, you could, they're not going to work with you. Like all of them are not going to work with you. So yeah. all I'm saying is work with the top tier people and nobody else. Like work with companies you would work for, for free. If you had to, like uh, right. you, it'd be an honor to work with whoever that you love in this community or stuff you actually buy, put it that way. So that's yeah. the rule number one. Now, once you get the big company uh, on your side, it's called social proof. You know, once I got that uh, billion dollar company, they were valued at five billion at the time. But the Razer right. gaming laptop company, once I got Razer, all the other companies who are top companies wanted to come aboard because they want to be associated mm-hmm. with the best of the best, period. The same right. way we have in the mastermind, like we want to be the best of the best coming together, not just random people in the mastermind. Yeah. And so, you know, then the image line stuff came, then the sweet water stuff came, then the art, you know, and on and on and on and on and on. So you just need yeah. that one big brand and they're going to attract all the other brands. And you can always leverage that to continue building your uh, portfolio of brands. Um, that so that's how, you, that's how you get into the brand thing. Now, when it comes to deciding opportunities, I would say one is look at it like crypto. Are you into crypto at all? A little bit, not as much as I maybe should be, but yeah, I just, I didn't want to get into it too much because I'm not educated enough on it. So I need to study the game a bit more before I go further in, but I've invested a little bit. Oh yeah, you would do like cash app or something? It's literally just, um, I have like coin purse and every now and again, I'll just put in with, put some into Ethereum and Bitcoin. They're the only two because I don't really know like the ins and outs of it. I accept crypto on my website so people can buy kits using crypto. So 
But that's as far as I've gone. I haven't gone deep into it yet. Oh, that's sick that you accept crypto as payments. That's super dope. Yeah. So, you know, imagine Bitcoin. It's kind of like matured almost. Of course, it can go up to 100K or whatever, but it's at sitting around 40K somewhere. It's kind of mature. It's, it's at its peak already. That would right. be like working with the top company. They're, they're mature. Yeah. Then you can work with companies that are, are budding, but they have really dope technology that's super cutting edge. And that would be like working with a breakout coin, like a Doge coin, for example, right. or a, uh, you know, or, or even Ethereum, which is still kind of young. We know it's yeah. super good, but it's just young right now. And yeah. that's the equivalent. So we're betting on its hyper growth in the future. And you want to build that relationship early. It's the same thing with, OK, we can work with Drake, who's already established, a.k.a. Universal Audio, Image Line, whatever. Or we could work mm-hmm. with an unknown artist who's extremely good and we know can get to a Drake level. And we can gain more energy going from, you know, one to 100 as opposed to 99 to 100. So right. that's the choice of who you're going to work with company wise or product wise. Um, and here's the deal structure. And this is the last kind of point I'll make about the, the brand thing. We could take upfront cash. We could take cash. Actually, there's three ways. Upfront cash. We could take yeah. back end percentage affiliates that you're talking about, or we yeah. could do upfront cash and a percentage. So the way you calculate that is you have to have data. Without data, this you can't really make an argument. So let's say you make three videos and it generated the company twenty one thousand dollars. That means right. per each video, that's seven thousand dollars you generated for them in profit. So you would take that number. OK, let's take twenty one thousand divided by three. because You have three videos. And let's say you just wanted 30 percent of that. You would take the seven thousand per video times 0.3. So you would get two K per video. And that's a fair amount because that's 30 percent of uh, the seven thousand that you're creating for them per video. But without the numbers, yeah. there's no way to know what to charge. You know, you could say three hundred and get and just miss out on sixty seven hundred dollars worth of profit. Or you yeah. could say, you know, I want. 5,000 a video. And then they're going to be like 5,000 a video. Like that's kind of insane. But technically you're making them more money, but you're taking the lion's share. It depends on how the company thinks on how they split right. revenue. Um, but that's, that's the math behind it. So you can justify the price and say, yeah, it's 2k a video because I know I'm going to be making you $7,000 on average per video. And this video is going to be up for a lifetime, which means you're probably going to be making way more than that in 12 months. So, and I'm endorsing you, giving you endorsed traffic, which is putting my name on it, my stamp, my face and approval, which you cannot get on Facebook, no matter how much you pay. And so yeah. having all that leverage, that's how you can be like, okay, this is what I charge per video. And if they don't want to go with it, they can use Facebook, like F them, you know, at the end of the day, yeah. they, we don't owe them anything. You know, they're trying to tap into what you've built and all the energy you put into just, and I always remember that. Like, so that's the math behind it. Now, a lot of people, I'll make one last point because I don't want to go on and on about it because not everybody's a YouTube content creator. But one thing I will warn folks about is uh, the NFR deal. Now, if you're, I just don't want people to think that if you just, uh, what's the word, suck up to these companies, that they'll open all these doors for you because no yeah. company is loyal. None. Okay. You have people in the company who may be loyal, but the problem with people in the company who are loyal, they're all employees. And chances yeah. are they're not going to be in the company forever. They're going to leave the company. So I built a relationship with this guy over at Razor, for example. He was really cool. But the problem is he was so dope that he got picked up by another company called Weed Maps. And now he works for a whole different company. So now it's like all that energy we went back and forth with this relationship. I have to do it again. It's like they don't even know me. Right. Okay. I'm with you. So there's no point in like sacrificing yourself to suck up to this company because, you know, it's just not worth coming in as somebody who's just underpaid and they're getting the most out of everything. So yeah. I would just, you know, when this is for everybody who's getting into YouTube stuff and this is my last point about this is when they offer the NFRs and the free this in exchange for a video, that's cool if you generally just like the plugin and you want to make content out of it, whatever. But yeah. to think that you're going to like be sucking up to build up a relationship, just that's not how it's working. Like people who respect you will pay you. Um, people who kind of are just trying to get over are just trying to get over. That's just what it is. So the NFR deal. I suppose are- once I suppose once you've done one thing for free as well, they're going to expect that every time. So if you do a video for free in exchange for a plugin, then how are you then going to charge that same person? It's going to be tricky anyway. Because yeah, they're just going to think, oh, well, this guy just does it for free anyway, so we don't need to pay him for anything. Mm-hmm. Now, to be fair, I did do a couple things for free. So I don't want to make people think never do free. Um, but right. I do want to say that the difference is if you gave them your sound pack, would they tell their audience about your sound pack? No, 
No. And it's like they wouldn't return the favor. So why are we making these companies millionaires? Yeah. You know, it's just it's not a fair balance. Like nobody would get into that relationship. If it was a romantic relationship, nobody would be in that relationship. It's a toxic relationship. Yeah, that's right. So would you would you advise maybe people that are just maybe people that are just starting to get into content creation and they're getting a few offers from companies, would you advise to take affiliate commission over an upfront fee, like all the time? Like if a company reaches out and says, We can give you this amount up front or we can give you 50% of all sales. Mm-hmm. Would you for advise your, to always take the affiliate commission? Yeah, for your brand, uh, the problem with affiliate commission is that p- people are picky. Like I did an affiliate thing with Sweetwater, for example, and you you can see what people are buying and what happens behind the scenes. I was doing that right. for more so data. For your brand, I would do, okay, I charge 2K. You're in the 2K range. I would not be like, okay, 300 for a video. Like you're not an underdog. Like you're established yeah. and you're you're in that endorsed area so i would say 2k for video period and if they do because here's the thing a lot of companies don't have affiliate software on the back end so that's that's another thing so you know the affiliate thing is like for the more advanced companies but you know um i would take the cash up front for now and just say in the future when you guys do develop an affiliate software i want 30 percent or 10 you know anything below 10 percent is kind of like wasting time like for real yeah 30% 30% for me is like the bare minimum. I just don't take anything below 30%. It's pointless. Um, and that's really the rule. So, right. yeah, I would take 2K up front. Because, again, it, the product would have to be super hot for me to want to take a percentage. I have to know yeah. that it's a home run product that I'm going to make $100,000 off of or something substantial, not just like right. 5K here, 5K there. Like, I need to know because... What I'm getting out of covering that plugin for the video is more so it's a branding move. It's like a positioning thing. It's not always about the the monetary aspect. So that's my answer to you. I know that was kind of convoluted, but I would do cash more so because, again, they're trying to get around Facebook. Have you ever run Facebook ads? I haven't. I've been meaning to, but I know there's been recent updates, especially for iOS users where they can kind of like opt out of targeted ads can't they so it's kind of made me step back and just be like right i need to actually either bring someone in to show me like how to do it properly or study it myself so i haven't actually run them yet luckily you know the organic like organic sales have have been good so i haven't i don't know i haven't run them yet but i definitely need to step it up and get into it somehow yeah, I had a lady come in. I gave her about 200 bucks um, and she just did all the pixel work and the iOS 14 stuff and updated everything yeah. so that it could work. Like it's a whole different like Facebook is like learning a different language. It's <laughs> just Gosh, uh, it's yeah. just so much easier to find somebody who knows what the heck they're doing. Let them in your account under a permissions account. Let them fix it and then just run your ads the way you run your yeah. ads. Because the amount of time like, that would save you is just worth more than what you're paying the person anyway. Yeah, like learning all this stuff. I mean, it's it's up to you. But, uh, yeah. you know, that's what's going to take you into the million uh, range is running ads because you're right. especially where you are right now. You have a lot of capacity, it's called. So t- what was the question there? I lost track. Um, we started off on the question with sponsors. Oh. You know, would you always take affiliate commission rather than upfront fees? But you were saying maybe at the start upfront fees. Here's what I was going to say. Yeah. So Facebook, you can't just go, hey, Facebook, I'll pay you in percentage of the sales of my product. They want hard yeah. cash the second somebody clicks on a link. They, right. They're not going for percentage. It's the same thing as money managers over on Wall Street. They take a flat fee. The reason is because you could fail or you could succeed when you invest in stocks. They're not going to yeah. be betting on you because you don't. You probably don't know how to pick stocks and and pick the winners and all this type of stuff. So they're like, give me a flat fee. Whether it wins or right. loses, I still win. And that's how we have to treat these uh, other companies is we're not betting on their success because we don't know if it's going to do good or bad. So why right. bet on them? Just give me the the flat fee, you know, and I win regardless. And that's, you know, that's, I know it sounds selfish and all this type of stuff, but at the end of the day, these companies are not loyal. You're making the millions of dollars. You should be able to enjoy all the energy that you're giving them. That's really what it comes down to. No, definitely. That makes sense. Mm -hmm. So, um, well, yeah, if we want to move on to the production stuff, (laughs) one thing that I wanted to say is whenever I'm, interviewing anyone or whenever I speak to someone about how they get into FL Studio production, 
I'd say like 99% of people say, well, I started watching BusyWorks Beat tutorials. Like the amount of people that have shouted you out is crazy, including myself, by the way. I don't know if you remember me messaging you on Instagram. I need to thank you for this actually, because before, when I, when I left my job and started a YouTube channel and wanted to like heavily get into production, the first thing I did was buy your mixing course just to improve my knowledge. And the other thing I did was I had a tight beat channel where I upload beats and I wanted to start tutorials. And at that time, I wasn't sure if I should just do it on the same channel or create a separate one. And I messaged you uh, for your advice. And you, luckily, you messaged back and said, start a new channel. <laughs> I think that was all you said. So I was like, right, busy says start a new channel. So I'm going to start a new channel. And obviously, that paid off. So thank you for that. And the reason I was saying that is because, you know, everyone seems to learn from busy work speeds. So if everyone's learning from busy work speeds, who did busy work speeds learn from? You know, how did you get the knowledge in the first place to share it with everyone way back when you started? Oh, great question. And I want to thank you for the testimonial. I got to go through your clips and like chop them out and add that to a reel or something. But it, it, I'll, before I answer you, that's crazy because I rarely respond to people on the, the, you know how there's three tabs on Instagram? Right. Yeah. And so I think yours was in that right tab or like the filter tab. And I don't know what made me randomly answer that day, but I rarely answer like anybody. So the fact that I even answered and yeah. it, it turns out you're a beast. I, I, re I remember the day. So at the, at the time, I think you posted something on your story saying I, I'm answering questions for the next hour. Or I think you, oh, you made some time that you had a slot. So I was like, right, I'm going to ask you now. So luckily I just got you at the right time. Oh, okay. That makes a lot of sense now. Okay. Yeah. But I'm, I'm again, I'm excited about yourself. I'm, I can't wait to pour like energy into your brand too. Um, Thank you. And your question, dang, I lost the question because I was excited. Yeah, I was saying if everyone's learning from BusyWorks Beats, so who did BusyWorks learn from? Oh, um, yeah. I had, how did you get the knowledge? Crazy enough, I was learning as I was teaching. Like I would challenge myself to, I'd be like, okay, you guys want to learn EDM, you know, Skrillex, growl bass? Okay, here's what we're doing yeah. today. And I would act like I already knew what the heck I was doing in the beginning of the video. But in reality, I was learning as I was teaching people. It sounds right. crazy. But the way I learned production was because I kept focusing on whatever it was. Like, there's four levels of competency. I don't want to eat up too much time with this concept, but there's four levels of competency. There's unconscious incompetence, which is like the bottom tier, which is you don't know that you don't know something. There's conscious yeah. incompetence, which means you, you know that you don't know something. There's conscious competence, which means you know that you know something. And there's unconscious competence, which means you don't know that you know something. So. Right. Excuse me. In the beginning, everything is unknown. You don't know anything. You don't even know what you don't know. So, excuse me. When you're doing tutorials and stuff, you're you're setting an intention or you're crystallizing something that's unknown and you're pulling it into focus. You're becoming aware. Right. So I go, okay, I don't know about the EDM Skrillex, you know, uh, base, and I start to listen yeah. and focus more. So we're going from the unconscious incompetence, not knowing what I don't know, up to conscious incompetence now i know that i don't know what that screechy sound is or i know that i don't know what that rumble in the bass is and so i start right. to break it down and basically you have a lot of fun when you take those unknowns and you pull them up to knowns whether you understand it or not as long as you're taking an unknown to a known knowing that something exists that's where excitement comes from so i was getting a lot of excitement making those videos Teaching myself, really, um, but not yeah. myself, because technically I was watching some videos from like uh, these other brands called, I think, Ask Ask Video or, uh, you know, I learned from Ken Lewis how to mix. He taught me mixing. Right. Um, you know, he's still OG. I got to plug him a little bit more. Um, who else did I learned from? Just random videos. I remember in the beginning I was on the site called, do you <laughs> have you heard of Audios or Audio Z or something like that? Yeah, yeah, I think I have. Yeah, I don't promote like, you know, the piracy thing. But in the beginning, when I didn't have any money and I thought nine ninety nine a month was a lot of money for SoundClick, yeah. I think I was I think that was the website where they would make me aware of the stuff that I didn't even know existed. Like they would put right. put up pirated like court tutorial things or something like this. I don't remember exactly, but I think yeah. that's what kind of brought my awareness to, um, you know, those tutorials or you know, or right. whatever torrent was out there, you know, I was riding dirty in the beginning because I just <laughs> broke. Like I didn't have like I even torrented. Let me tell a quick story. I uh, found a torrent of my mentor, Frank Kern's uh, seminar with Brendan Burchard. And it was called what was it called? MMF. So Millionaire Marketing Formulas or something like that. Yeah. I don't know how I stumbled across it. I really don't remember. I just remember Jeff Walker got me into knowing about Frank Kern and then on and on and on and on. 
So Frank Kern's a good business guy, online marketing guy. My point is, okay, yeah. I had a, a you know a, a not legit copy of their seminar, <laughs> and I watched that for two days straight, and yeah. I was just brain hypnotized, like, and that's what kind of kicked my business off. So if I would have never come across that video because I was poor, I would have never created Busy Works Beats, which changed the entire world. You know what I mean? So right. sometimes we can't judge the people who. Um, are doing those things because they may be just using that as like a loan or like a seed to then want to give back on huge levels. Like, for example, I have a plugin ca called Hermes, and I don't know if it's cracked or bootleg somewhere. I don't care. Like, you know, the people who are going to buy are going to buy. The people who don't just don't have it right now. It's not that they don't want yeah. to. I'd rather be known and know that I exist than try to chase down people for bootleg and stuff. That's so stupid to me. Yeah, definitely. And just to wrap up the story is that um, after seeing that two-day seminar with Brendan Bouchard and Frank Kern, I then, like, four years or five years later, had a, a successful business in this huge thing. And I met Frank Kern in person at his, at his uh, seminar in San Diego. And I said, and the only words I had for this man were six words. Uh, Thank you. You changed my life. That was wow. it. <laughs> like, I didn't say anything beyond that. I just said, thank you. You changed my life. And um, what did he say back to that? He was like, oh, man, no, I didn't. Or he, he just like kind of brushed it off. I was like, yes, yeah, you did. Yeah. I don't think you understand. <laughs> and uh, but I ended up selling that money back into his business and promoting him more. So my point is, yeah. you know, even though we were riding dirty with the tutorials, trying to figure out what the heck was going on and piecing all that information together, yeah. you know, we made it easy for the next folks so that they don't have to go do what we did. And um, but, you know, at the end of the day. Anybody who, who jacked any software, forgive yourself and just look at it like a loan. You know, pay them back by making tutorials about their company. Um, you know, pay them back by telling people about this plugin that you found. Pay them back by making presets about the plugin. And like, yeah. that's how you, that's because you're making the company money indirectly. But I just don't want people to feel like guilty. I mean, because, so that's all I'm trying to say. Yeah, oh, no, that okay. makes sense. I, mean, I feel like most, most producers start off like that. Like, most producers start off with no money and, you know, imagine if everyone, if every single producer in the world, like there was no option to pirate FL, there wouldn't be a lot of producers right now that are as <laughs> successful as they are. You know what I mean? Not that I'm promoting piracy either, but I feel like for that exact reason, like you said, like it's like a loan, isn't it? You'll probably, you'll most likely pay that back in the future or you should kind of pay that back in the future somehow, whether it's buying the plugins further down the line. You know, maybe you start off with a cracked version, but then once you actually make some money, if it's through music or through whatever, then buy the actual version and, like you said, make tutorials, promote them, like whatever it is to like pay it back. So uh, I think you're right. Indeed. And, and and then once you get to the paying for stuff side, you're just kind of in that mode. You really you rarely go back or ever go back to the other side. But yeah, I remember I had to make a lot of money before I started like getting into legitimate things. I remember yeah. my some videos I used to blur out the screen because it would have like some kind of <laughs> crack plug in, and I would just want people to know. So. I just want people to know, like, even myself, I don't want to seem like I was super clean in the beginning. Um, yeah. I'm not saying it's right, but I feel like now they have, because we've, you know, taken all those steps and done all the organizing. Now, if you go to, for example, I'm not plugging something, but if you go to, I'll just say my website, I'm not even going to say what the name of the website is because it's not Busy Works Beats. It's a different yeah. website. Uh, but if you go to that website, for example, you get megabytes and megabytes of sounds that are the sounds not like kind of the sound mm -hmm. i'm talking about the 808 the clap the you know preset for whatever the project files so they don't have right. to do all that jacking that we used to have to do. pause jacking sounds weird they don't have to do all that hijacking <laughs> that we had to do <laughs> yeah uh, back in the day they, there's like a, a treasury of now stuff that we can hand over to them that they don't have to waste their time doing all that stuff so now they can get yeah. it legit is what i'm trying to say Fine. It's, it's good that you give me back now and um, so when, when you, because when I went back on the channel um, just earlier, I think the oldest video I could find was, man, I, I think it wasn't even that long ago. I want to say 2014. Did you delete a bunch of the old content? Yeah, if you even check on like a site, like I think Social Blade might have the data. It's just a right. dip of like 3,000 or 3 million views or 10 million views. And that's when I deleted a bunch of videos. That, they were getting views, but it made me look like an idiot. Because, like, my first video was, like, not even my voice. It just was a screen recording of me just clicking around in FL, oh, really? making this terrible beat. It was horrendous. Was that the reason for deleting them, then? Just because you wanted, like, the quality <laughs> had improved and you wanted to get rid of the, the old ones, which didn't not, represent you well? Not entirely. It was also because I got a, a copyright strike from ImageLine, weird enough. Um, oh, really? And it was a video about how to sample. 
And I didn't know how to like investigate the video. So I was like, what is happening? Like, I don't even know how to fight this thing. Cause I didn't yeah. own the sample. So that's like, I can't really claim that. I didn't know what right. they saw in the video that made them copyright strike my channel at the time. And I said, why would you copyright strike a person who's making you millions of dollars? Like it made no sense. Yeah. And yeah. so I could tell there was like a weird energy with them. So uh, at that time I was just like, I don't want this to happen again. Cause it was crazy. Like you get a lot of uh, consequences for getting even one strike. Like you can't do yeah. certain things for a certain amount of time. I forget the consequence, whatever. So I went through and I deleted anything that could potentially even trigger that same event, like anything that had to do with sampling. That's why I was so right. paranoid to even use samples for a long time in my videos. Anything that had to do with anything that I thought was, I didn't know. So I just deleted yeah. stuff. And also I deleted it because it just, it just looked bad. Like, you know, my first video was terrible because people judge me. Okay, here's the last thing, you know, I'll say about this quality stuff is that people judge you on your older videos because YouTube tends to promote like the older stuff or they used to at least. And right. it's like, I have new stuff, but nobody watches the new stuff. So they would see videos from like 2017, be like, yo, your beats, his beats come out trap. I mean, of course they were <laughs> whack back then. Like, let's be honest, they were not <laughs> amazing. It took a long time to get them to sound decent. And uh, so they would see those videos and be like, yo, busy stuff, what is he doing? You know, but <clears throat> they yeah. had to remember there was no busy for busy. There was just, it was course, just, yeah busy so everybody else is watching this stuff being supreme off the gate and i had to kind of learn my way into it so anyway my point is yeah i had to get rid of videos that were making me look like a, a complete amateur um and that's why you see a big chunk of videos missing so yeah. maybe you'll have that point out i doubt it because it seems like you came in kind of hot yeah i mean maybe the first few videos that i uploaded I didn't really know exactly what I was doing. I wasn't like the most confident person like on camera. So it's one of those things you just approve along the way, don't you? So I have, yeah, even like at this stage, I, I think, oh man, maybe I should delete some of the old videos, but I've, I've kept them on there. Cause the part of me thinks it's good for people to see the growth as well. I think it's good for people to look back and think, oh man, he started off like this and that's the level that I'm at. So maybe I could start. Whereas if everything looks pristine, people might be like, oh, it's just always been good at making beats. You know what I mean? So Very I think it might, it might help people. It might encourage them to, to start their own thing. Yeah, sometimes I wish I didn't delete like my old mixtapes off the internet because I wanted to hear myself rap again like 20 years later. So yeah, <laughs> keep them, keep them. But like my yeah. channel was so random back then. I would upload videos about theories about Grand Theft Auto V like because it didn't come <laughs> out yet. So I made this weird theory video. It was just so random. Oh, so was it always music production? Yeah, like just over content as well. I was just trying stuff. Yeah. It was just random. It just looked, it didn't make sense, like the videos that I had. Um, yeah. So that, yeah, that's another reason. But it really was triggered because of them giving me that copyright strike. So that's the, the main thing. Right. Have you uploaded any sampling videos since? Because I've done a few sampling videos where a copyright claim has come through, but not a strike, where it's just like they're going to monetize from the video or. I think it's, I don't know if it's up to them to decide what to do, but I've had the claim come through, but not an actual strike. So I was wondering if, if you've done a sampling video after and had the same kind of problem. Mm -hmm. um, now I use TrackLib stuff, or at the time I was using this other company called Epidemic Sound because they have like a library of sounds that are pre-cleared on your channel. So I was right. like, I'll use these because they're pre-cleared and there's not going to be any issue and people saying I don't mm -hmm. own anything. Um, and darn, you said something nuanced. Oh, copyright. Back in the day, yeah. The copyright system was not as clean as it is today. Like it was very yeah. janky. And um, so my point is I had to. Um, so let me tell a quick story. I forgot a story. So the, the way my channel got popping, which is the way yours got popping, is you hopped on a trend for the most part. And it got your channel popping. You created a name. Now people are like looking at you for anything. Yeah. now. It's not just drill. So. In the beginning, I made a Tom Ford uh, remake of Jay-Z's beat called Tom Ford. And I got a hunch because my mom was talking about it, blah, blah, blah. So I remade the beat, put it up on the channel. It got like a million views and two million. And that was the thing that kind of broke me into awareness, like people knowing what my channel right. was about. And uh, it was just a trend. You know, I just hopped on a random trend. And yeah. then, so I got a copyright claim in the beginning of that uh, remake, which is they'll let it ride and they'll take the money from your video. Yeah. But then like a year or two uh, years later, Universal Audio, or excuse me, Universal um, Music, the company right. that approved the video came back and gave me a strike for the same exact video they approved like a year or two oh, ago. Uh, 
So yeah, oh, that's shit. how terrible that's how terrible the system was. And I don't even know if it's the same today. So even though somebody can approve your video for like Universal uh, Music or Warner or whatever, they can still come back later and just create a strike. So I didn't want that. And oh, that's um, crazy. Yeah, and that's when I got that F- that image line thing. I was like, what, like, is it because I'm recording FL because they own FL? I didn't know what it was what was happening. Yeah, and that's so, a strange one. Well, and that was was there a sample in that video? Uh, yeah, it was a sample. I don't know what they even claimed. You know, yeah. I think they thought I was like promoting piracy, even though I wasn't. I don't know what was happening. To be straight with you, I yeah. have no clue. But I do know they go after channels image line specifically that has like the like Team R2R or whatever in the top corner or like oh, yeah. uh, Team Air and all that type of stuff. So if you guys yeah, are, yeah. for your audience, <laughs> if you're recording video, cha- save the project file so it says something else. Don't leave it as Team Air or Team R2R. <laughs> like don't. <laughs> There's a classic Curtis King story about that, isn't there? The, his video that he put out when he was uploading pirated. Well, he was uploading videos using a pirated copy of FL. And I think they, they found out, didn't they? And then he did the apologizing video and everything. So... <laughs> oh, Curtis Everything King. Everything reminds me of that. Yeah, Curtis King. Oh, Curtis King. I thought he said Kane at first. Oh, Curtis oh, King. Oh, no, yeah. no, Curtis King, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and, and that's, you know, and then he opened up a new chapter that way. And and, and uh, with uh, Carnage from, was it Carnage? Yeah, Carnage from uh, the Razor campaigns. People remember, you know, the guy who said, like, make your 808s way harder or, like, more harder or something like that. I forgot what he said. <laughs> but uh, he used like a, a cracked version of Silent or something in the video because it wasn't his. He had to use a new laptop, so all his software was on a right. laptop. And they like punished him for having like a pirated Silent thing because Silent contacted mm-hmm. Razor apparently, and was, I don't know if they threatened to sue, but really, at least a oh, DMCA shit. takedown. So it's just yeah. you know stupid stuff like that. Just if you're yeah, using anything pirated, careful. like what's up? I was just saying you gotta be careful. Gotta be careful. Yeah, like at least I just want to give a warning to people who are on YouTube. I don't want them to screw up in the beginning. So if, if anybody's using stuff that's pirated again, in FL in the top left, change the name from Team R to R, Team Air to something else. Save it. Okay. <laughs> right. Now if you also, uh, you know, on certain plugins, it'll say the name of the company that cracked it in the actual like it says licensed by, and it'll say their name. So yeah. cover that up. You know. Um, you know, know the difference between the old Nexus that is cracked and the new Nexus because Nexus 2 doesn't really exist anymore. It's Nexus 3. But yeah. even still, you know, the difference between the, the logo, like the logo is different on the on the real Nexus versus the one that everybody kind of cracked. Just know right. that stuff so that when, you know, so that you can kind of smooth ride until you get to a point where, you know, they can afford all this other stuff with the YouTube checks that they get. So, yeah. Yeah, That's, and then it's time for them to, to pay back, like we were saying earlier. It's time to give back at that point. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm not, again, I, I'm not here to judge people because the question is who keeps cracking this stuff? That's what I want to know. Yeah. Who team Air, by the sounds of it. <laughs> but who is Team Air? <laughs> You're like, what do they get out of it? That's my question. Yeah. Why do they keep doing it? Yeah, yeah. Who knows? Who knows? It'd be interesting to see who those people are. You're right. I you, just you, imagine like a room of hackers... Drinking cans of Monster, just cracking, <laughs> cracking plugins somewhere. <laughs> what if it was an employee of the company? That's what I'm saying. Like we yeah. don't know who's actually doing this stuff, so I don't yeah, want to ever right. make somebody feel guilty. You're right. So, man, so uh, can you remember when you uploaded your your first ever video? What year first, was it? Uh, I just remember I was in a Facebook group trying to learn how to sell beats from Dame Main Beats. Um, right. and it was a group about how to sell beats and I was just trying to help another guy in the group. We used to give each other feedback and I was just trying to help yeah. them understand a the concept in production. So I recorded it, put it on YouTube, didn't even realize like the world was looking at it. It was just yeah. for that specific person in the Facebook group. And that's how the channel grew. It was answering people's real questions, yeah. excuse me, with video because you can't really write how to do a filter sweep or like stuff like you can, course, but yeah. you can't write music production. You got to hear it. Yeah, exactly. And see it. So, man, so you started with that video, and then how, how would you say your game plans changed over the years? Like, in the beginning, did, did you even have a, a game plan? I think you said you were just uploading content, you know, and then at one point, one video popped off. But now, because the algorithm changes all the time, has your, has your game plan changed? Are you uploading? Because I know you do quite a bit of different content right now, don't you? But you do have the audience to do that, but... What's what's like the game plan with, with your channel right now? How do you kind of structure it? How do you think of videos? 
you know, what's, what's the thing? What's the plan? Good question. Uh, so I'll give a timeline so people understand that just what I'm doing now doesn't necessarily mean this is the thing somebody else should be doing because they're not at yeah. this specific point yet. So in the very, very beginning, I was an artist and I actually liked rapping on everybody else's beats back in high school. Then I ran out of beats to rap on, so I started making my own. And then I started producing for other artists. And from there, I started producing uh, for mixtapes called, uh, oh, Hipstrumentals. That's what it was called. Hipstrumentals right. mixtapes. So I did like eight mixtapes with them before I even had any kind of name. Then I did YouTube videos to help friends in the Facebook group. And also I did like a, a beat channel. Like my channel had beats on it too for sale and sound click. And I did the whole sound click sound uh Kind of the equivalent of the Beat Stars, but back in the day. Yeah, yeah, I remember SoundClick. Oh yeah, you remember those days? Yeah, and, uh, definitely. <laughs> so, so uh, from SoundClick days and being a producer, putting beats up on the channel to helping people with YouTube videos. Now, from there, your quality increases over time, and then you go to YouTube revenue as the first income source. I realized yeah. that you know I could build a business around this, so that's when I learned from the mentor, build other products. And, and then that's what took the income from, you know, 600 a month from YouTube at the time to 6,000 yeah. a month. Like literally from like this month to that month was like 10 X. Um, and I just remember that point in time back in like 2013 or 14, one of those years. Um, and then that went up 10 X. So that was cool. And it just kept going up from there. Thank God. <laughs> so, uh, from the YouTube revenue to products, then I'm trying to think what was next kind of expanding the product base. To making like, right. I think I had 39 products at, at a point. Then I made a membership site where people could learn ongoing and university level music production training. Then from there, um, what's the pathway? And I think I got into sound design. I forget the exact path, but then I got into plugin yeah. development, which is where I'm at right now. And now I'm just wrapping all that stuff under one umbrella and right. uh, just kind of creating an ecosystem to flow and kind of keep people all on one pathway and help them as much as I can. So would you say you're mostly focused on one thing? Like are you, are you mostly focused on the plugin side, the core side, or is it, would you say it's equally spread out, equally balanced? Mm -hmm. like, do you put most of your energy into one particular thing? Um, I'll say a bigger business. It's like a car. Now, if I just focused on the engine and I didn't focus on the tires and the wheels, like the car's not yeah. going anywhere. <laughs> so. But if right. you have a terrible engine, like your car is not going to run no matter how great the tires are. So the engine in this case would be the what in this case would be the cash flow business, which is the, yeah. the products that we mentioned that you're going to be adding soon. And um, that's going to send the gas through the car. You know, it's going to pump the gas or the cash through the car, the vehicle. And yeah. and like and so I had to, you know, once the engine's decent, you have to kind of step back and make the tires good, the wheels good, the axle you know all the other stuff all the stuff that's not pretty inside of a car you have to build that too yeah. and um that's something that like i'll say this i have a lot going on but i tend to focus on one project at a time like right now right the latest project this is not the prettiest thing ever or the sexiest thing ever in business but i had to fix the back end email sequences for multiple series in the business now nobody can see this right. in the front end um, but I had to learn how to convert and, and create value on the back end aut to automate my business. I worked right. on the business, not in the business. People want to make videos all day long. That's not the whole entire business. Yeah. So to answer your question, I tend to focus on something that's urgent. And then once right. that's complete, then I'll move to the next thing. Uh, I know it's yeah. probably not the answer you wanted. No, that makes sense. It definitely makes sense. Mm hmm. So, so how about for, for, for your YouTube content, like right now, do you have some kind of structure and game plan for what type of content you release or is it just whatever kind of comes to mind that day? Oh no, I had to learn. Uh, well, sometimes it's whatever comes to mind because I'm most energetic yeah. about those videos. I have a, yeah. I don't know if I can screen share on here, but I had a, um, a spreadsheet full of all these keywords. So I did keyword research because right. okay. all the, because YouTube is a, a search engine based platform. And our yeah. job is to supply the demand. So the, yeah. the demand is what people are typing in. Like you said, you notice people are typing in drill beats. Okay, you need to yeah. supply that demand. And that's how we bring in new audience. So I basically mapped out all these keywords. I even have a video on YouTube called like secret keywords for beat makers or something like that. Secret SEO secrets right. for beat makers. And I go through it. It's like Playboy Cardi type beat, uh, NBA Youngboy type beat, like all the top keywords that are being searched. Yeah, And that's 
what I'm, so I have an outline of like all those keywords and I'll reverse engineer. So if I'm trying to rank for, let's say, FL Studio tutorial, I'll make a whole bunch of ideas for FL Studio tutorial, how I'll spin that keyword. But the problem yeah. with kind of that, it does give you motivation because you know exactly what people want. But at the same time, you're just like, this is boring. You know what I mean? Like right. this. Yeah. Yeah. So it's a balance of like going through keyword research and just spontaneous, whatever your brain kind of thinks of at the same time. Yeah. So what I found interesting was, because just while I was on the topic of keywords, is I think if I'm right, you so let me go on your channel just to make sure I'm saying the right facts. But I think the video that's performing best or has the most amount of views is a video just called Trap Beats Are Easy. Yeah, I'm right. going to double check. Which isn't necessarily a keyword that people are searching for. People aren't just typing in Trap Beats Are Easy. They might type in how to make a trap beat. But I just find it interesting how, you know, you can spend a lot of time on keywords, searching exact keywords, but then, yeah, it is. So trap beats are easy. That's the one that's kind of performs the best or has the most amount of views when that isn't really focusing on one particular keyword, if that makes sense. Oh. Sorry, my, hold on. My music just blasted in my ears. I was trying to follow you there. <laughs> oh, my bad. <laughs> you know that channel video, like the channel trailer? Yeah, yeah. Uh, my bad. My music is blasted. And anything you said in the last Sorry. five seconds, I completely missed. Oh, it's all good. I was just saying that it's interesting how, you know, you can focus on keywords and looking for exact keywords to, to put in your title. But then the video on your channel with the most views right now is a video that's just called Trap Beats Are Easy, where, you know, people aren't necessarily just typing in those exact words, Trap Beats Are Easy. They might type in how to make a trap beat or a trap beat tutorial. But yeah, I just found it interesting that the one where you might not focus on SEO the most is it has got the most views at the moment. Right. I had to move your screen to the left. So if you see me looking over that way, it's because you are to the <laughs> left so now and I'm looking on the right side. You're right. I didn't even know it had 3 million views on it. Whatever. That's cool. It's crazy. Um, yeah. And I have a tool called TubeBuddy, which shows the keywords. So literally yeah. the keywords are like the most simple, basic keywords. It's FL Studio. Trap beats are easy. Yeah. Busy work <laughs> beats. It's, it's like not even... Yeah. I think people OD on the keywords. Here's the thing that is counterintuitive that I had to learn about. Um, let me make your screen full screen again. The thing I had to learn about keywords is that in SEO, if you have too many things that have the same metadata, it's actually a penalty. Oh, so really? it's better that we use less, more accurate tags than try to squeeze in every related tag for every single video. Because the search engine can't understand the difference between this video and that video because they use the same metadata. Right. And that that's actually a negative thing. So the fact that that video had like six tags on it, which is super simple, trap beats. After, I guess I got lucky with the with the keywords, to be honest with you. Um, yeah. And another element in, you know, getting those type of views is one, your energy has to be right. Like um, one of my other pseudo viral videos was about a uh, guitar melody. And I remember I made that video after I came back from seeing somebody who I really wanted to see at the time. And yeah. I was like, like full of good energy and i just made a video like sponsor and i had an isotope shirt on just randomly because that's the yeah, shirt yeah. i went to go see the person in and i forgot to switch shirts or whatever but that video just went up because the energy was right there's no like right. we this is more esoteric so forgive me here but we humans are like most people think we humans are just these dots imagine a line that just has a bunch of dots we're not the dots you know we are the in between we're the energy in between. We're the stuff in the chasm. We're not the dots. The dots are what we crystallize because we're the stuff in between. So anything right. you see right now, like even this physical world, this stuff is made of electrons. I'm not truly solid. Like there's a, a lot more uh, hollow space in my hand than there is actual physical space. If you get down to a, uh, an atomic level. Yeah. My point is what makes us human if we're really not solid? What makes us organized chaos and it's because we have this energetic spirit or the observer some people call it the ability to collapse potentiality and my point in saying all that is to say it's not about the dots it's not about the seo the stuff you can trace it's not about the analytics sometimes it's the energy and what we yeah. create with the energy is then we go to try to measure it with um the dots because there's no right. other way for us to understand it same with music theory like the best musicians are just hammering it out Here's a, a kind of mindset shift for you. I didn't realize music. I used to think that people started with music theory and then they made their songs. Yeah. When in reality, music theory was invented to understand what the heck people were doing. Like, let's say right. Jimi Hendrix would just jam out 
They created yeah. music theory to try to understand what he was doing. It's a secondary thing. It's not a, yeah. you don't start with music theory, you end with it. It's an analytical thing. So my point is, people who are on YouTube and all these other platforms, you don't start with the analytics. The analytics to show you the demand in the market. You start with your energy, your creativity, get your energy right, get your, like, get your feel good. And yeah. from that, then you can create these cool things that tend to go viral. But, oh, here's one more thing about it. I think we have to create stuff that people naturally want to share, stuff that makes them yeah. look good to their friends. Um, because a lot of videos I make, you know, it's so secret of a technique that nobody wants to share it. So I'm kind of like <laughs> shooting myself in the, <laughs> in the foot. They're like, dang, this is too much sauce. Like, I'm not going to, like, they want the advantage. They're not going to just share yeah, the secret. Right. And uh, so you got to make, not you, but anybody has to make videos that people genu genuinely want to share to make themselves look cool. Yeah. And it's, I found that a more opinion based content is the thing that people share because they're like, what do you think about this topic? That makes sense. That's interesting to think about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. You put it well there. So it's, I don't know. To answer you though, I don't know how that video got how many views it did. I have no idea. What? <laughs> one of those ones that just rides the algorithm wave well it feels like some videos just you can't even explain it some just do really well but i think you're right in saying that, that you know the energy has to be there if you focus on just making the best content that that you could make and enjoy it whilst you're doing it then you know then i feel like the benefits just kind of come with that whereas what you said earlier some people can focus so much on the keywords that they forget to focus on the actual content itself they're just focusing on boom, I'm just going to type these keywords and hope that people find it through the search engine. But it's not always the case, is it? No, you definitely got to do market research. It's the first step in any business. And um, oh, I was going to say one more thing about the uh, trap beats are easy thing. Oh, most of us make mistakes on YouTube. We're trying to entertain the in-between people. You know, they think they're not beginners yet and they don't think they're Timbaland yet. So the yes. in-between space, we're you're like we're trying to entertain those people. Those are the people who don't buy, who don't support because they think they know it all. That's why they're in yeah. between. And I found that working with the beginners, people who know that they don't know something and the really advanced content is what works because the beginners right. think they could be advanced. <laughs> Let's be honest. And yeah. the beginners still need beginner stuff. It's the in-between crowd that the channel kind of suffers. And the more content I make for the in-between people, the channel doesn't grow. It just stays there. So the more right. we cater to the beginners and advanced content, that's what attracts both beginners and advanced people, mostly beginners. Um, but even people who are in the interim, the uh, intermediate, they go back to revisit those foundations. So that's the content yeah. that works the best. It's just, you know, beginner level or advanced. All the in between, like how to, how to, how to you know, I'm trying to think of like an in between <laughs> video, like. Uh, you know, the spins or uh, Cubase's secret melody salt, like that's in between stuff. Right. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. But yeah. So Let me ask you this. So how can people, how can people deal with negativity in the producer community? For example, if a producer, maybe he's thinking about starting a, a tutorial channel and, or he's thinking about uploading beats, but he's scared of what people might say because like there is, there is negativity in the producer community. Luckily, there's a lot of positivity, but I think in people's heads, the negative side outweighs the positive side and it holds them back from putting out content, putting out beats, putting out tutorials. How do you think people can overcome that fear of being judged or having someone say something negative? Mm -hmm. Like what that's, kind of mindset do they need to have? That's a good question. I was thinking about this the other day, how people deal with that anger. Um, I think in the beginning, we do need some form of positive reinforcement to keep doing it. You know, imagine dating a girl and yeah. all she does is point out the negative things you're doing. It's like, why you're yeah. not going to want to date the girl anymore. <laughs> so you do have to have some form of positive reinforcement in the beginning. I'll say that. Um, right. And it just shows you if it's a market match. So any negative negativity you get, I would repurpose it to say, OK, I'm clearly not matching what the market actually wants. You know, I, yeah. see, here's the difference. I've had a moment in my life. And I told my girl this other day where in college we were just going out to every party. And when you get that much social socialization, is that the right word? Yeah, not socialism. When yeah. you get that right socialization going on, you get rejected so much that you just kind of get used. You get to see what works and what doesn't work. Like wh right. when you say hi to somebody, how do you say it? Do you say, hey, do you say, do you try to do a stupid pickup line? Like all this stuff, you see what actually works. So you have to go through all these iterations of changes and approaches. Now I got yeah. that kind of 
personality thing, you know, out of my way for the four years in college, I got to experiment with all types of approaches and words and whatever. And yeah. people who haven't had that don't have the, didn't have the opportunity to be rejected that much. So I think right. that added to my ability to, to accept the rejection on some level. Yeah. Um, but again, I still feel like you need positive reinforcement to keep going at something. Um, Definitely. but what was I going to say though? I was going to say something particular and it slipped my mind. Forgive me, Jay. Is that, so good. Oh, dang, what was I going to say about positive? Oh, in the beginning, what really hurts is when you're running your ads and it's a video ad or something like that, and you're just getting yeah. put trashed on the ad. Like that's going <laughs> to hurt your feelings. I guarantee it hundred yeah. percent. It's going to hurt your yeah, feelings. Definitely. I had a successful ad campaign. It was make, I spent like $60,000 on just one ad for music theory. And I had to turn it off because of the amount of, like I was trying to uh, retort people in the comments and like, you're wrong. This is why this is right. And yeah. you're spending so much mental energy. I literally had to turn off a successful ad. I could have made millions if I just would have kept running the ad, but because it took such a toll on me, I turned it yeah. off. So the number one mistake is reading comments thinking that they matter. I had to learn that negative comments are just as important as positive comments. They both create a positive result in the algorithm. And so once I learned that, I said, okay, I need haters and I need people who like it. I can't just have one or the other. Like it has to be both because yeah. the people who like it are going to fight for you against the haters and the haters are going to pull in more people who could potentially like it. So you yeah. need kind of like the yin and the yang. You need the negative and the positive to keep this machine going back and forth. If you just have one side and no opposite charge, it's just not going to move anywhere. So I had to learn that haters are kind of required for success. Um, and I know that's hard to believe, but you know, once you get past that point, because I'll even say this, when Curtis King was on my channel, we would go live uh, for music yeah. producer conversations and he would see like a negative comment that, tr you know, triggered him. And he would just focus on that person for like a minute or five minutes. And, and that's probably what they were looking for. They were looking for that bit of attention. Yeah. And I'm not putting this on Curtis King. It's just anybody. Yeah. There's this thing called, you know, thick skin. And you really, I'll, the only way you can develop that is time. Like it took me, you know, six years in business to really not give a freak what people have to say. Like at the end of the day, yeah. I said to my girl, I said, if they're not paying you, if they're not paying us, what, like, what's, what are their, what's their purpose in life to just watch my stuff and, and say mean things? Like what, it, they have no purpose. You know what I mean? Yeah. So anybody who's not paying me, it's just like, you're not paying me anyway. You can hate all you want. I'm probably not going to get any money from you anyway. So you might as well hate on me to pull in your friend who you think is going to hate on me. And they turn into a right. lover of me. And now I'm getting paid from the person who I was never going to get money from. So yeah. I'd rather, um, you know, let the haters. The only thing I'd really address people on is lies. So it's one thing to not like my content. Cool. But if you're saying yeah. like I scam somebody or I rob somebody, that's when I usually make a video addressing it. Outside of yeah, that, yeah. you know, I just look at the philosophy like haters are your free marketing campaigns. So yeah. don't be afraid right. to uh, stir the pot a little bit. Of course, yeah. I think it's good to have people that dislike you because if you try and please everyone, you obviously can't please everyone. And if and if you are just being like neutral, you don't really have a big impact on anyone. Whereas if you have people that dislike you, on the flip side, you're going to have people that really like you. And they're the people that are going to fuck with you and they're the people that are going to buy your kits and invest in your brand, you know. But if you are just this neutral person who's not really being himself, who's just trying to please absolutely everyone, then no one's going to feel any type of way. They're just going to be like, all right, I'm not really invested in this person, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You're right. And no, that's the middle ground. Remember I talked about there's beginner, yeah. there's advanced, and there's that middle ground. That's the indifferent right. zone. You don't want to be indifferent. You want because hate can turn to love. This, unless people are in those relationships where they've gone through heartbreak and like I've seen positive 100 and I've seen negative 100. Like I've yeah. seen both sides of the spectrum quite literally in relationship. And I know how quick hate can go to love and I know how quick love can go to hate. <laughs> so yeah. it's the same spectrum, not the same frequency, but the same medium and you know, for example, this is like my last example here is like I used to think Young Thug. I didn't understand Young Thug when he first came out. I was like, right. what do people I was like, what are people listening to? And then he then he made this song called Check from, I think, Barter five or Barter six or whatever. And that yeah. converted me from like this side to that side. And now I'm like, Young Thug is, is dope. Like I went from not yeah. understanding it, not liking it to completely liking it. Same thing with, I think, Playboy Cardi. I didn't understand it. And then when he came out with his last album, um, you know, I forget the name of the album. Yeah, I forgot I to, was, but I know which one you mean. I was converted. And so haters are more easily 
uh, have the ability to be converted. Whereas people who don't care, it's going to be extremely hard to get them to react and convert. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. No, that makes sense. Well, then one other thing that I wanted to ask you is, it's a question from the Discord, actually. Usually I, when I'm about to do a podcast, I'll tap into the Discord, see if anyone's got questions. And Scorpio Beats wanted to ask, what are the main pros and cons of being a music producer, maybe a full-time producer? Mm-hmm. So what, what's the main pros and cons of doing what you're doing? Yeah, I was just telling Nicole this. I said, because she, she asked me, like, my vision of what I wanted to be or something about along those lines about being a music producer. I don't, I see myself as a music producer in skill set, right. but not as a title. I actually see myself as more of a, a business owner than a music producer. Yeah. And I say that because music production takes time. That's a super con. I'll start with the cons first. It takes a lot of time. Unless people have that, you know, had that experience where they spent eight hours on a beat and they go to present yeah. it to an artist and the artist says no in like the first three seconds. Yeah. Like unless they've had that experience, they don't understand how <laughs> frustrating it can be to just spend so much time and just get rejected. Right. And because of that factor, I tend to steer away from being a only a music producer, meaning like, you know, only make music for people and publish it and do all these different things because I'm not afraid of rejection, but I feel like, you know, my time's not guaranteed to return. And right. I think that's why music producers and artists are at the bottom of this kind of music industry pyramid is because they're taking all the risk on time like think about yeah. mcdonald's right now what are they actually buying what do you think well mcdonald's buying yeah what are they buying well they're buying ingredients for a start from <laughs> somewhere <laughs> that's gotta True. be the main thing right burger buns. <laughs> <laughs> burger buns now mcdonald's can't operate unless it has what workers yeah of course it cannot operate they even up their uh, wage to 15 dollars an hour because they're running out of workers now what are they buying from the workers? Their time, I guess. Time. McDonald's cannot operate unless it buys time. Yeah. And when I realized that I was selling time as a music producer, I realized I was always going to be at the bottom of the power structure because right. the biggest companies buy time. That's the highest value thing. They buy it from people who don't understand the value of their time. So they buy yeah. it. And that's, the, the main con about being a music producer is the time you'll spend to just get one idea. Now you can leverage your friends and get the loop pack circles going and all that type of stuff to make beats quicker and, you yeah. know, leverage your, your uh, friend's audience and his opportunities and network to get potential placements. You can do that. It's just the time for me that it kind of turns me off from music production as a, as a, as a lifestyle, uh, as a uh, career path. And plus right. another con is Let's say you do tend to make more hits and more things that work great. But now you got to pull up to studio sessions. I live in outside of Philadelphia, uh, PA. Right. Now, most people who are in the music industry are out in L.A. or uh, yeah, basically L.A. to record. Yeah. That means I have to fly from Pennsylvania, which is on the east coast of the United States, fly to the west coast, which is like a four hour, five hour flight. Yeah. just to be in the session with them to maybe may or may not be able to place another record or do whatever. So it's too much physicality, too much time exchange for me. Yeah. Um, and then the third con I'll say about production is cr- with creatives, you'll learn this when you run ads. Creative is the most like there's so many variables that we don't know. Whereas business, it's like, OK, you do this, you get that. You do this, you get that. In music, it's like you do this, you may or may not get that. <laughs> you know, right? Like yeah, what combination? Like is it? Yeah, like what combination of the hi hat and the snare? Is it, if if I nudge the hi hat a little to the right in milliseconds, it changes the whole vibe. Now that's a whole different. There's so many variables. Yeah. With the creative side, and that's the third reason why. Um, it's just again, it comes back to time, and all those things kind of dictate time. So and that's the con side of being a just a music producer. That's why I respect you. You're yeah. not just a music producer. You're a content creator. That's your identity. You just happen right. to be skilled at music production and you're really ready to build a business around the music as well. So it's, yeah. it's way bigger than just being a music producer. Um, the pros about being a music producer, you create your own. Uh, now, this is considering that they're going to be entrepreneurs, but you can create your own time schedule, which is a good and an evil at the same time. Because when I first started college, freshman year, I had so much free time, I did not know what to do with it. So I ended up doing a bunch of bull crap and not studying and did really bad (laughs) because I had too much free time. I didn't know how to handle the free time. 
So the cool part about music producers is you can kind of manage your own day and create your own stuff. But the problem is, again, you have to be your own manager, which is yeah. unless you're really disciplined, you're not going to be hard on yourself. You're going to pick up your Xbox controller and play Xbox as much as you want. Mm. So it's kind of like a pro and a con, but I'll call it a pro. Create your own time schedule. The second cool thing about music producers is that we literally create the strongest magnet in the entire universe. And what I mean by that is I was on this app called Clubhouse. Um, and on Clubhouse, you're talking to VC venture capitalists, you're talking to investors, you're talking to film, mega film people, just really important people. And at the end of the day, they need to leverage culture to make their tech platforms popular. And without giving you a whole business dissertation, well, shaking my whole desk, sorry, <laughs> is that um, tech companies are selling for high multiples right now. They're called high growth companies. So if I made an app on my phone and you know, sold the app. It could sell. Let's say I was making a million dollars a year on the app. I could sell yeah. the company for ten million. This is a ten times multiple. I could sell it for twenty million because it's a twenty times multiple. In tech, you get these huge sellout moments. And they, the problem with tech is, yeah, you could have great technology, whatever. But the problem is they lack culture. So they right. beg for culture. Like they will pay any celebrity to use their app because they know that once they get the culture on their side, the coolness on their side, yeah. everybody else will come over and try it out. So music is the number one thing, period, that attracts all culture. Like I want people to understand, music is the magnet that pulls people onto all these tech platforms and pulls them onto all these new business ideas. Music right. does that. Not celebrity, music does that. And once you understand the power of the magnet that you're creating literally from scratch, and you're responsible for trillions in commerce, not just millions, not just billions, trillions in commerce. Once you understand that power, then you're going, OK, I have a magic wand called FL Studio. Mm. And then you're like, OK, this music thing is not just selling to this artist, selling to that artist. It's, you know, I don't want to get too deep into it, but it's thinking about, you know, the publishing deals they get, the royalty buyouts they do on the back end, like all this other yeah. stuff that comes with just creating a magnet. So just understand as a music producer, you're creating, you're the greatest magnet creator in the entire universe called music. And lastly, as a pro to be a music producer, oh, you get to collaborate with almost everything. Music can go right. behind a video game. Music goes in a restaurant. Music you can do a song with somebody. You can always collaborate. It's a lot easier to collaborate over music. Same with uh, yeah. books. That's why a lot of people write books because you can end up on any podcast. It's easy to talk about. It's a book. Yeah. And so music and uh, writing are those top collaboration tools. So those are the pros of being a producer. Best collaboration uh, you know, accelerator. You have the ability to literally create magic on your computer. And thirdly, the pro was... Uh, uh, what was it? oh you get to dictate your own time yeah now the cons that's perfect. Guys, is a good way to put it <laughs> it's a good way to put it yeah man so hopefully i gave some encouragement i know i didn't give the biggest fl studio tips today <laughs> but uh, no i mean i feel like i feel like people will enjoy the business side like i said a lot of people that have been on the podcast so far have spoke about uh, music you know building up youtube channels and no one's got in depth about like you know the business side of it all so i think people will really enjoy this one I know I have anyway, so <laughs> hopefully. hopefully everyone else has. But man, mm -hmm. I won't keep you any longer because I know you, you, you know, you're a busy man. You've probably got a few things to do today. Um, but I just want to thank you for coming on the show once again. Like I said, I think people will really enjoy this one. And also just let everyone know if they don't know already where they can find you on social media. If you've got anything coming out soon that you want to share with people, then yeah, let them know. Awesome. Thank you, brother. And yeah, we're running on the two hour mark. So this is a good combo. It's like, yeah, yeah, I got 10 websites. Go to this website, that way. No, just, <laughs> you can just type in Busy Works Beats and you'll find me somewhere. And uh, the thing I'm promoting right now, I'm about to do a launch for my software. So you'll probably see me running ads or something, talking about the software. Um, yeah. There's so much. Yeah, that's pretty much it. Yeah, this, this Google Busy Works Beats. Learn more. You'll find something that you like, hopefully. Cool. So thank you. Perfect, Mama. I appreciate your time once again.